Indeed, Merry Christmas. Well, we're so glad that you're with us, and uh, we're going to get started this afternoon, but Emmanuel, God with us. What's in a name? Uh, do you know what your name means? Tyler, our Oconomowoc campus pastor who does, who's doing an excellent job out there, his name means tile maker. Tyler, tile maker. It's true. Uh, Bradley, our incredible worship pastor who was just up here, his, his name Bradley means singing from the broad meadow. It really doesn't. It just means from the broad meadow, but I like to add the word singing, <laughs> you know, kind of like the sound of music. You can see him at the top of the hill. Uh, Blake, our youth pastor, his name means attractive. I don't know about that, <laughs> you know, but I will say this. He's doing an attractive job with our students, so I'll give him that. Philip, our kids' pastor, who you saw earlier, his name means lover of horses. No wonder he's a kids' pastor. Uh, I don't know about if he loves horses, but I know that kids love our kids' church. He's doing a great job. Lionel, our Hispanic pastor, Lionel means lion-like. Yeah, come on. And lions are known for their bravery and for their courage. And so leaving his native Cuba and becoming a citizen of the U.S., guess what? It takes a lot of courage, and I'm sure glad he did. And I, I love Pastor Leonel, and I wish you could know his heart like I do. He loves Jesus. Do you know what your name means? Todd means fox. Thank you very much. <laughs> it also, another book, it said fox hunter. And I'm not sure about the fox part, but I do know, anybody that knows my wife, I'm a really good fox hunter. All right? <laughs> so what's in a name? What's in a name? The search engine Google was originally named Google, G-O-O-G-O-L, uh, which is a word for the number that's represented by one followed by a hundred zeros. After the founders, uh, Sergey Brin and Larry Page, presented their project to an angel investor, they received a large check made out to Google, G-O-O-G-L-E. And as usual, money talks. Uh, that check decided the spelling of the name of the company right there. Well, what's in a name? If you're in business, a name can be worth billions of dollars. A name like Nike is thought to be worth about $7 billion. With Coca-Cola, 10 times that much. What's in a name? When you give a name, you might, you might want something original. You might want it to sound unique or uh, identifiable. And when you give a name to a company, you want something that provides the ultimate product recognition. You want people to say that name and be reminded instantly of your product. God is good at giving names. Uh, so far in the month of December, here at the church on Sunday mornings, we've been looking at Isaiah 9-6. We've been looking at this, these four names that God says would be true of his coming Messiah. That verse says, for a child is born to us, a son is given to us, and the government will be upon his shoulders, and his name will be Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. Now, there are over 200 such names given for Jesus, given for the Messiah throughout Scripture, over 200 names that he would be known by. And here are just the ones, I'm not going to give you all those, but let me give you the ones that are just in the book of Isaiah. Chapter 4 says the coming Messiah would be the branch of the Lord. Again, 9-6, wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. In chapter 11, he would be the root of Jesse, the banner of salvation. In chapter 32, he would be known as the king. In chapter 40, he would be known as sovereign lord and shepherd in chapter 41, his name, your Redeemer. In chapter 42, he'd be known as my servant. In chapter 53, he would be a man of sorrows. And in chapter 60, he would be your Savior. Now, I skipped one that's found in Isaiah because it's the one we're going to talk about today. And I think it may be the most important one. It's found in Isaiah, not, in Isaiah 7, 14. And it says, all right then, the Lord himself will give you the sign, look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. 
The Christmas story in Matthew chapter one backs up this prophetic verse and tells us exactly who that prophecy was speaking about. Matthew one, beginning with verse 18, says, now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All of this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. See, it's super critical what that angel told Joseph. Uh, This baby that Mary was carrying wasn't normal, and it didn't happen in a normal way. This was God's child, and you are to name him Jesus. This is in fulfillment of what Isaiah had spoken about 700 years before Jesus' birthday, that there was coming one, Emmanuel, which means God with us. Now, how amazing is that? I want you to think about, think about this, that there are many different levels to getting to know a person, right? Lots of different levels. You know, you, if somebody says uh, about, you know, your favorite NBA player, let's say it's Giannis, and you go, oh, yeah, I, I know Giannis. Do you really know Giannis? Right? Like, you know who he is. You don't know his favorite color. You don't know his, what food he likes. You don't know his sense of humor necessarily, uh, though he has one, which I appreciate. But there's different levels of knowing. And so I want you to think about it. There are several people that come to Bridge, uh, several married couples that found each other online and, and developed a relationship and got married. I want you to think about in that sphere, like the different levels that are present there. First, they probably saw each other's profile, and the likelihood of you knowing somebody from their profile and what they wrote about themselves is not high. You could memorize what they wrote about themselves, and maybe some of it's true, all right? But it's a a very low level of knowing. And then one of them reaches out to the other and expresses interest. They swipe right, and and they express interest. Uh, Then there was a first contact, probably an email or a message, and then they take it another level, and there's a phone call, right? A little bit more personal. There's phone conversations, maybe dozens, maybe long ones, but it helps them begin to get to know each other. Maybe they even do a FaceTime call so they can see each other and make sure that the picture on that said profile is accurate, uh, but it's another level of knowing. But at some point, for that relationship to take the next level, they actually have to meet, right? They had to spend time with. When God wanted a relationship with us, he didn't, he didn't just send a book. He came in person to spend time with, to be with us. See, Jesus is God with skin on. He wasn't a demigod, he was fully God. He wasn't 50% man and 50% God, he was 100% man and he was 100% God. And as such, he had no weaknesses. Jesus, God with us. And so I wanna look at those three words for the next few minutes. God with us, first word. The first word, God tells us of his person that Jesus was God. And how do we know that? Well, there's lots of reasons. I don't have time to go into all the different arguments and evidence for that, but I wanna look at just one stream of that evidence uh, this afternoon, and that is the overwhelming number of fulfilled prophecies, the things that were written hundreds of years before about him that came true. First, concerning his birth, There were a number of prophecies, including that he would be born of a virgin. Uh, That by itself showed that he was was deity. 
that he would be born in the line of David, in the family tree of David, which Jesus was, that he would be born in Bethlehem, which was true of Jesus. Then concerning his earthly ministry, there were a number of prophecies, including that his ministry would begin in Galilee, which it did, that he would perform miracles, which he did, that he would teach in parables, which he did, Preceding his crucifixion, there were several prophecies about him that he would enter Jerusalem on a donkey, which he did, that he would sacrifice his life to save sinners from sin. Concerning his death on the cross, there are numerous prophecies that were fulfilled, such as he would be betrayed by a friend, that he would be sold for 30 pieces of silver. It gives the exact number in the Old Testament how many pieces of silver he would be betrayed for that he would be forsaken by his disciples, that he would be accused by false witnesses, that his death would be by crucifixion, that he would be wounded and bruised, smitten, spat upon and mocked, that his hands and feet would be pierced, that his garments would be divided and lots cast for them, that gall and vinegar would be offered him, and that his bones would not be broken, all of which were fulfilled. Concerning prophecies after his death, there were, there were prophecies including that he would rise from the dead, and that he would ascend into heaven. Now, that is a lot of fulfilled prophecy. So what is the statistical probability that all of these prophecies could have happened to a single person by mere chance? So if somebody says, like, okay, I, I'll give you that all those things happened in Jesus, but that was just a coincidence. Like, what is the statistical probabilities of that? Uh, Dr. Peter Stoner, in his book, Science Speaks, uh, figured that out. Like he did some mathematical uh, probability calculations, and he states that if just eight of those, for just eight of those to come true by chance in one person, that the chances of that are one in 1.7 sextillion. That is the number 17 followed by 21 zeros. To illustrate, like how remote that possibility is. He gave an illustration in his book to help us conceive of that number. He said, if you cover the entire state of Texas uh, and it's almost 269,000 square miles in silver dollars two feet deep, and you were to mark one of them, and then you were to blindfold someone and let them roam the state of Texas, but they can only pick up one silver dollar, the chances of them picking up the one silver dollar that was marked is one is the number 17 with 21 zeros behind it. Like there is zero. I mean, we can literally say there's zero percent chance that that would ever happen. That's the possibility of just eight of these coming true. And yet there's over 300 prophecies made about Jesus and 61 like major prophecies that it's very clear that he fulfilled. So Jesus is God with skin on. Second word, with. The first word tells of his person, that he's God. The second word, with, tells, of his, tells us of his presence, that it's with. Not only God over us as sovereign Lord, the big man upstairs, right? Sovereign Lord over us, not just that, although he is certainly that. Not only God for us as gracious Lord, although he has demonstrated that time and time again, and not only God in us as living Lord, but God with, God with us. See, he's with us to save us. He had to become a man to pay man's penalty, man's penalty for sin. Jesus is with us to help us know that he understands us, that he's been there, that he's experienced the same temptations as we have, yet without sin. Jesus is with us on earth through his teachings that we discover or we find in God's word, the Bible. Jesus is God with skin on. And among the very last words that Jesus said on earth before he ascended to heaven to be on the right hand of God, he said in Matthew 28, be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now, funny thing, almost as soon as those words came out of his mouth, he left. I, pro I mean, that kind of funny. Like, I promise, I'm with you forever. See ya. You know, and then he was like translated and he went to heaven. And you're like, wait a minute. Were you telling us the truth when you said that you would be with us forever? How can he be in heaven and yet be with us at the same time? 
John 14, 16, Jesus, this is a promise that he made. He said, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate. That word another in the Greek, it means one just like me. Another advocate who will never leave you. So if he won't ever leave, guess what? He's with us. So God, Jesus says, I'm going to ask for another. I'm going to ask for the Holy Spirit, right? Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit to be in you. He could be with you all the time. So the first word, God, tells us of his person. The second word, with, tells us of his presence. And now the third word, us, tells us of his purpose. His purpose was us. To save sinners. To save us. John 3, 16 and 17 in the Passion Translation says, For this is how, is how much God loved the world. He gave his one and only unique son as a gift. So now everyone who believes in him will never perish but experience everlasting life. Verse 17 says, God did not send his son into the world to judge and condemn the world, but to be its savior and rescue it. See, he came for us. That was his purpose in coming. We were his purpose. His very name tells us of that purpose. Matthew 121, and she will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus because, for, he will save his people from their sins. Jesus is the Greek transliteration of the Hebrew name Yeshua or Joshua. And it simply means Jehovah is salvation or Savior. And that explains the second phrase in Matthew 121, for he will save his people from their sins. He would be Savior. The angel told the shepherds of this child's purpose. He said, don't be afraid. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. John the Baptist told multitudes of his purpose when John said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away what? The sin of the world. Jesus himself told us of his purpose. He told Zacchaeus, for the Son of Man came to seek and save those who were lost. And the Apostle Paul told young Timothy of, of the purpose of Christ. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And then Paul said, and I, I'm the worst. See, Jesus Christ came into the world as a baby to live a perfect life, to die a criminal's death and raise from the dead, to rise from the dead for us. See, Jesus is God with skin on. He is Emmanuel, God with us. And I wanna ask you a question this morning. How would your life be changed if you were absolutely convinced that God himself was with you? How would your life change if you were absolutely convinced that God himself was with you, that he was with you in your hurts, that he was with you in your struggles, that he was with you in your victories, that he was with you in your losses, that he was with you on your best days, that he was with you on your worst days, that he was with you in your joys, that he was with you in the midst of the hardest and deepest grief, that he was with you. And that's the promise from him. But one level deeper of a question is, are you with him? Like his promise is that he would be with us, but are you with him? Because it's one thing for, for somebody to say, like, he's with me, and you go, like, yeah, I'm not with him. I'm not with him. You know, please don't lay claim to me. You know, have you ever been in that situation where that somebody, like, yeah, he's with me, and they've been, like, super obnoxious or annoying or whatever, and you're like, mm-mm. I don't know him. <laughs> you know, you try to beg that off. This is in a much more serious way that he says, you're with him. Like, I'm with, I am with. God with us. But he really wants to know, are you, are you with him? Do you lay claim to him? See, it says he will save his people from their sins. But the question we have to ask is how? 
Right? Romans 10, 17 says, faith comes to us by hearing the good news. And the good news comes by someone preaching it. So you have heard, you're hearing the good news today, that Jesus is Emmanuel, that he's God with us. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 says that God saved you by his grace when you believed. And that word believed there is a word that means like committed to. It's not just like head knowledge. He says God saved you by his grace when you believed, and you can't take credit for this. Even your very belief, you can't take credit for it. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we've done, so none of us can boast about it. That means you can't be good enough to earn it. You can't do anything to achieve it. The only thing that we can do in regards to salvation is believe and receive. We believe he is who he said he was. He's offered the gift, and we just simply receive. I want, if you would for me this afternoon, every head bowed and every eye closed. I'm not going to ask for any kind of raise of hands or anything like that. I just simply want to pray a prayer today. Jesus says that he is with you. If you want to take a step today, maybe to this point in your life, you've not been with him. If you want to take that step today, again, the Bible says we do that by praying. We do that by believing and by receiving. So I want to pray a prayer today, and I invite you to pray this with me. For the sake of those that are praying it for the first time, I'm just going to ask if you would for all of us to pray it out loud together today. Dear Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. Thank you for your promise that you are with me. Today, I want to be with you. I believe you are the Son of God. I believe you died on the cross for my sin. I believe you rose from the dead to show that you were God. I receive you as my Lord and Savior. Transform me from the inside out. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. I'm going to invite the ushers to come at this time. The way we're going to close our service today, we want to illustrate the power of this greatest gift that we've been given. What a difference hope in Jesus makes. And we're meant to share that gift with others. So we're going to turn off the lights. We're going to sing Silent Night. Our ushers will receive the light from me. And they will go to the end of each row and light the candle on the end of that row. And when your candle is lit, you can pass it on to the person next to you until everyone, everyone's candle has been lit. We do have battery-operated tea lights for kids and for Mark Heinzelman. And uh, I'm just kidding. You're welcome. I love you, Mark. But if you didn't get one and your child would like one, they're just right outside in the sanctuary. Uh, out the doors there. But please keep the candle, we like to say this every, every year, keep the candle vertical. All right, we have, a, we have a rule. If it's lit, like don't tip, all right? We wanna, we'd like to keep wax off of like our stuff, so if you'd help us with that. The lighting of a simple candle can have a profound effect if you don't keep it to yourself, but you give it away. Like this is one of those rare gifts that you can give away and you can still keep, kind of like love.